Hi, this is Kevin Plask from Paradise Found Studio, and we're back again in my home parish of Transfiguration Catholic Church, and we're going to be looking at the cupola window here. So we're going to talk to Father Pat and Dale Molnar all about this piece, and it's amazing the kind of thought that put it, uh, was put into this. So let me take you through it really quick. So the cupola window, as you can see, over the altar, you've got this surround a window and they're going to get into there's a lot that went into this piece basically the story of creation but it's amazing because he actually designed it for certain seasons to come in and project the light down below so we're going to get into those kind of details i was blinded when i first got here the cupola was just glass and uh, you'd be sitting there trying to celebrate Mass. Uh, you couldn't see the congregation. You couldn't read the words in the book. It was blinding. And I knew we had to do something uh, to shade the uh, priest so he could carry on with the Mass, but also to bathe the church in uh, color. And good old Dale came along. I, re I remember watching someone trying to do the reading at the ambo and covering up their head like this so they weren't proclaiming the word they were kind of hiding from from that blinding light and at the time when uh, monsignor expressed this at mass that there there was a there was a problem he, he had also gotten um, a proposal for glass from a company the process started with looking at that um, design that had been submitted and it it was um, it was nice uh, it would have allowed color to come into the church but there wasn't any theology involved in it so we started having discussions about the theology and uh, Monsignor came up with with the idea of, of the the theme Creation, through new life, through the purple of aging, through the hint of the gold of Easter, bursting forth into the red of Pentecost, and then moving back into the cycle of life with the beginning of creation. So that it, it's a continuous flow all the way around the space. I then, having looked at this light, thought it, instead of it being a detriment, that we should be able to make that an asset part of the design. And I started going up on the roof and putting little stickers on the clear glass coming down in the space to see where exactly the, the light was casting a shadow. And in that way, to sort of gear the design to connect to specific liturgies throughout the liturgical year. That process was available because stained glass is, is a slow process and the way I work is also slow. I, very, very slow. I start with listening and and then I start accumulating what I think are the materials. And There were glass companies all over the world but I wanted very specific things and as I was doing that I had enough time to start mapping the light in the space. Today of course with digital technology there's probably a program that you can use to just automatically do all of that mapping but I was doing it mechanically I was climbing up on the roof every week or two and and see we had to the replace way. the roof <laughs> eventually I came up with this flowing uh, apparently simple um, flowing pattern and made it so that it didn't have a lot of imagery that would detract from the lit liturgical action that was going on underneath it, but still had the capacity to project light into the space and at the same time 
you know, nobody had to uh, shield their eyes when they were doing the readings anymore. At Easter, a golden bath of light on the sanctuary. At Pentecost, bursting into red. In the normal times of the year, the color of green, which are the, is the color for the ordinal times of the year, bathes the sanctuary. At times, a blue light will light up the baptismal fount. It, it, it brought a living, moving art to the sacred space. Genius. It was, I have to say, it was always collaborative, though, that Monsignor and I had long discussions about the theology. We still have long discussions about theology. Endless. I was able to make some really nice things happen with the light. During Lent, the light, the um, purple and gold light tracks across the altar platform week by week during Lent and then raises up onto the rarados um, at, at the conclusion of that liturgical season. And an uh, interesting story, um, at the Feast of the Baptism of the Lord, blue light that comes from the uh, mature life and works side of, of the cupola shines on the central hanging cross and then over to the font and shines on the Holy Spirit banner. And years and years ago, we had a vicar, and he was standing there in the aisle and talking about how baptism and the baptism of the Lord is directly connected to Calvary. And above his head, in the copious incense, was this line of blue light of which he was completely unaware. But after that mass, several people came up to me and commented on it. And there are all sorts of things that happen with the light that people will come up to me and say, Dale, did you know? And people think it's an accident. And it was so beautifully thought out by this artist that um, <laughs> It just seems like a vibrant, alive part of what we're celebrating in the liturgy. I, I remember our first Pentecost, and Pentecost is difficult because the date changes, so the angle of the sun changes year to year. So I had to change the shape of that little bit of red so that most years it, it can connect, and Deacon... Um, forest was at the ambo the altar is vested in red the priests and deacon are vested in red and the ambo was vested in the red light it was it was uh for for me it was satisfying because it worked <laughs> it didn't just happen it was planned these panels may not appear so but they're four feet by seven feet. They're really large, but they're up, up high, so you might not get the scale of them. So it's not something that I could install by myself, and we hired uh, pro professional glaziers to help with that. They had seven levels of scaffolding, and they had it tied off, and when they built the scaffolding, they put a level on each leg and made sure that it was even so seven levels of scaffolding, each one moves a little bit. By the time you get up to the top, it was rocking. I was not comfortable being up that, but I had to go up and ins inspect the installation as it was going on. Oh, ye of little faith. And I was white knuckling it. And they said, Dale, don't worry about it. You know, it's rocking, that's fine. It's when it stops rocking that you have to worry. In constructing the glass it's a very large panel and I had to extend the tables that I build the glass on to make sure that I had enough room so that I could flip them over and solder the backside and put the rebars on the backside as well 
and rebars is another problem because the windows are so large lead is always a soft material and it'll have a certain amount of flex and so over time you've seen old churches where the windows are kind of bowed out they're lit literally collapsing under their own weight so we put rebars on so these panels um, have not had any of those problems because they were structurally a little bit over designed you know the, the professionals think of everything I, uh, one of the little things that amazed me I would never have thought of it but that's why we had you um, in all the stained glass windows you see uh, they were put up against the existing glass and um, so that humidity would not build up in it he had to put little holes throughout the the actual stained glass so that they would breathe not fog up and lose their color so they're uh, in the corners at the bottom and uh, corners at the top so that it forms a uh, convection as as the air that's sandwiched in between heats up it has somewhere to go and new air comes in underneath he does good work the, the other thing in the cupola, though, is that occasionally there will be liturgies in the evening or, or, or at night. And so glass was chosen that has some opalescence in it, some streaks of white, so that at night, looking up at the glass, when the lights are on inside the space and there's no light outside of the space, you still get the movement, the flow because you can see that, that um, white streaking instead of just black glass. And the color is, is so warm and inviting that it's just another way of putting a welcome mat out uh, on the street to welcome people into the worshiping community. It's really a very warm and beautiful sight at night. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please hit like and I'd love for you to subscribe. We're trying to build our subscriber base. If you have any comments, please leave those behind. God bless.